Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Characterization of Functionalized Nanoparticles Using Ambient Ionization Mass Spectrometry. I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of LCGC and Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this seminar presented by LCGC and Spectroscopy and sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on improving the health and safety of people and the environment through the development and delivery of technologies, services, and solutions that are used in critical applications. From environmental monitoring, water analysis, and food safety to clinical diagnostics, drug discovery, and biomedical research, Perkin Elmer is committed to advancing science, collaborating with customers, and putting innovation into action for a healthier today and an even better tomorrow. We have a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. The webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box, and you can find that by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of your window. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of your window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your window. Before we get started with today's presentation, we have two very brief polling questions for all of you in the audience. Please click directly on your screen to answer. First, what segment are you part of? Academia, doing research on new nanomaterials, government or regulatory, industry or other? Again, what market segment are you part of? Academia doing research on new nanomaterials, government or regulatory bodies, industry, or other. And in just a moment, we're going to pull up our second question. Okay, great. And here's our second question. What is your primary application of interest for nanomaterials? Environmental, such as fate, bioaccumulation, bioavailability, toxicity? Biomedical applications, such as nanomedicine and nanobiotechnology. Industrial applications, like surface coatings, textiles, nanocomposites, and cosmetics. Or D, energy applications, like fuel cells and batteries. So once again, click, click directly on your screen to answer the question. And please tell us, what is your primary application of interest for nanomaterials? Environmental, biomedical, industrial, or energy? All right, well, thank you all very much for taking our polling questions today. I would now like to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Chatty Steffen and Dr. Sharanya Reddy. Dr. Chatty Steffen is the Manager for Global Applications Nanotechnology at Perkin Elmer. He received his PhD in Analytical Chemistry from the University of Montreal in 2008. Dr. Steffen then worked as a product ma project manager for QSAR Risk Assessment Services before he joined Perkin Elmer as an inorganic product specialist supporting the inorganic business. Over the past few years, his main research activities at Perkin Elmer have been in developing single particle ICPMS. Dr. Sharanya Reddy obtained her PhD from the Department of Chemistry at the University of South Carolina, Columbia in Maillard Chemistry relating to diabetes research. She did her postdoc at the University of California, Davis. She currently works at Perkin Elmer as an LCMS applications scientist. She has published in several peer-reviewed scientific journals, and her research interests include studying small molecule quantitation and identification by LCMS. Thank you both for joining us today. Chatty, please go ahead and get us started. Thank you, Laura. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all those who, are, who join us today on the call. Um, I will um, go through a few slides before I introduce Dr. Reddy, who's going to be really talking about more of the technical aspect of today's webcast. Uh, today's webcast uh, title is The Characterization of Nanomaterial Thick Organic Layers Using the Anxin DSA TOF. Uh, this webcast is actually a second webcast in a, in, a, in a series of three webcasts. The first webcast was entitled Single Particle ICPMS um, and its advantages in analyzing nanoparticles in environmental matrices. 
During that webcast, we had Dr. Uh, Kevin Wilkinson and Dr. Uh, James Ramville. Uh, both are um, two uh, very known um, researchers that worked on the environmental implication of nanoparticles in environmental matrices. The webcast uh, occurred on November 24th, and it is uh, and uh, it is available for viewing at the link that shows on your screen. Today's webcast is the, really the characterization of the functionalized nanoparticles by ambient ionization, or the DSA of mass spectrometry. Dr. Shiran Heredi, uh, we're going to be jo um, talking more in depth about this uh, this application and this technology. As for the first, uh, as for the third webcast. We really we're going to have um, Dr. Jeff Taylor, who's going to focus on the uh, UV Vis near IR platform when it comes to the characterization of nanomaterials and nanostructures. Uh, without overdue for today's agenda, I'm going to briefly introduce the uh, motivation uh, behind Perkin Elmer engagement uh, around uh, nanotechnology and uh, uh, the different platform that we're trying to put together towards. Uh, improve and enhance our capability uh, towards the characterization of nanomaterials. And then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Reddy. She's going to talk about the Angstrom DSA DOF mass spectrometer. And then she's going to talk mainly deep down about the application, which is really talking about the systematical approach to the instant identification of organic layers on the surface of nanostructures. And then we're going to go through a, a small conclusion and a recap about today's webcast um, and a small reminder about what's coming in the future. As far as introduction to nanotechnology and the application of nanoparticles, I, um, I like to use uh, the, the slides, and it's really uh, from a website that talks about nano and me. It's mainly it's a general website that talks about the, uh, the, the usability and the, um, the different consumer products that currently contain nanoparticles and the different challenges that the scientific community is facing when it comes to uh, characterizing nanomaterials, either from the perspective of um, looking what happened to them in, in, in the environment, or even at the early stage. You know, we are trying to come up with new materials for a specific functionality, and we want to be able to um, uh, track, uh, improve the quality control of the manufacturing process. If we are uh, to look at what is needed from, and we follow what the National Nanotechnology Initiative is posting and is after, its main most urgent priorities is really uh, to be able to get some metrology and analytical methods to track engineered nanomaterials. And this is where we went with the series of webcasts in which, um, as a first part, we really talk about um, the, um, the single particle ICPMS, and today we're going to be talking about the DSA DOF. But before I get more into there, if you look carefully at the, at the screen and you look at what is needed when it comes to the characterization of nanomaterials, um, a researcher or anybody working in that field of advancing on creating new, uh, new materials would want to measure a lot of characteristics for us to be able to come up with an answer to is it toxic, is it not toxic, uh, uh, are the physical characteristics enhanced or not. So there will be lots of platforms and analytical techniques that could be involved in that. As uh, we did in the first webcast, we looked at the single particle ICPMS. We handled uh, the blue side of the graph where we're talking about the composition and a bit of the size. So we would actually use that technology to count and size nanoparticles. And in addition, it will allow us to know about uh, what are these nanoparticles made from, um, iron, metal, nickel, or, or so ever. Today's webcast is really going to focus on the uh, DSA TOF. So basically, the DSA TOF is uh, an ambient ionization technique. It's going to allow us to um, characterize the organic layers that are sitting on the surface of nanomaterials. And this is really is going to handle, we're going to use that technology uh, basically to look at the organic section of the chart where we're talking about the targeting ligands. So basically, it is really going to help us understand how uh, about the surface chemistry of nanomaterials when they do interact uh, with uh, the external world, meaning the matrices or the different solutions. As for the third webcast, we're going to be talking about the UVVIS near IR platform and the different module that can come and put on this um, uh, on this platform, and this really, um, I will talk a little bit more about um, about it at the end of this webcast. 
going back to uh, the nanoparticles and um, uh, nanomaterials, and uh, so when we are talking about functionalized nanoparticles, most of the research would like to know what are the organic layers or the capping agent uh, sitting on the surface. And this is, could be a therapeutic agent, permeation enhancer, or, or a targeting agent. I mean, if you look at this picture, it's really a complete drug design approach to a nanoparticles. Um, and I will let uh, Dr. Reddy talk more about how can we differentiate, can we look about different molecules on the same nanoparticle and so forth, and she was going to uh, take us through that. But I just went on my last slide for today before I uh, turn it over to Dr. Reddy. I just took that from uh, the below website just to show you the different application of nanoparticles, either from a product side or from industry side. And if you look at it, I mean, Functionalized nanoparticles or smart nanomaterials with a functionality to them are being used in so many different products um, and, and, and uh, have, been, uh, been, have, been, have been produced by so many industries. Um, I will let you read the, the, uh, uh, the list uh, at, your, at your own leisure. Um, as for, uh, for now, I will turn it on to uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, she's going to be uh, talking about the Anxion uh, DS8 off mass spectrometer. Uh, Dr. Reddy? Thank you, Chadi. So I'm going to begin the, uh, I'd like to discuss more details on the DS8 off at this stage. So before I actually get into the experimental details, I thought I could give you a quick overview on what ambient ionization mass spectrometry is all about. Uh, as the word suggests, ambient, uh, the ions are formed in ambient conditions, which means the ions are formed in, an, in the ion source outside of the mass spectrometer. And what this allows the uh, user or analyst to do is directly sample of sample surfaces with no sample preparation. So uh, this is an example shown on this picture where the analyst has, is interested in examining the powder uh, as to what is in the powder and has placed it at the end of a melting point tube uh, and is placed this tube between the ion source and the mass spectrometer. So in completely ambient conditions and is analyzing the sample and identifying what it is using the mass spectrometer as a detector. So I'd uh, the detector that we used for all of these experiments was the Perkin-Elmer Axion 2 TOF. It was, it's a time of flight mass spectrometer. Um, and the specifications of these are listed on the right-hand column. Uh, the key features that one needs to sort of remember for the TOF is that it gives you an excellent mass accuracy. And there's a statement here on the slide which says mass accuracy of less than or equal to 2 ppm at mass to charge of 1,000. And what that means is if you have an ion of, say, 1,000, uh, you are going to get mass accuracy right up to the fourth decimal place. This, along with isotope profile information together, can help you identify the elemental composition of the analyte that you're looking at and uh, hence help you to probe more into what the structure of the molecule could be. So this is the key. Uh, feature of the TOF that is uh, being used uh, in all of the experiments that I'm going to show you uh, that helps us identify what these target what these analytes are attached to the nanomaterial. So this is the uh, ambient ionization source. This is how it looks from the outside. It's called the Direct Sampling Analysis uh, system or DSA that's coupled to the TOF detector. The lower bottom corner shows the figure of how the DSA fits onto the TOF mass spectrometer. Uh, what is unique about this source is that it has covers, so the user is not exposed to any harmful outgassing. I'd like to show you a quick movie here on Simply how the place or pipette your sample onto used. the DSA sample the holder. The here is placing the liquid Close on the, the door mesh. of the housing uh, and click the, the run button. We started with our proprietary atmospheric pressure chemical ionization design that led us to a unique ambient ionization source. 
as the nitrogen passes through the corona region. The high voltage needle interacts with the gas to generate a plasma that is then directed at your sample. When the plasma impacts the surface of the sample, desorption and ionization create a rich stream of analyte ions that is uh, this technology. This is a schematic of the ion probe of the DSA probe and how it looks uh, from the inside. Uh, what I'd like to highlight some uh, in interesting features that are provided with the probe. There's room for infusing liquid through the liquid inlet. Uh, and what this allows you to do is, uh, during sample analysis, you can have calibrant, mass calibrant flowing in, in case if there is any drift in the TOF mass spectrometer during analysis that could be corrected for with this mass cal calibrant infusing while the sample analysis is happening at the same time. Uh, the other way of using this liquid inlet is to change the chemistries of ionization. So for instance, if you have samples containing aldehydes and ketones, you can int introduce a, a liquid, uh, you could introduce a very dilute solution of ammonia that could make ammonia maddox of these aldehydes and ketones that can then get ionized and be detected by the mass spectrometer. Uh, there's the heater uh, temperature that is uh, on the ion gun that can be varied. So if, for instance, you have a sample that is uh, not very volatile, you, you can increase the heater temperature so it experiences uh, um, more heat and gets vaporized and improves the sensitivity of the ionization. If the sample is not very volatile, uh, then uh, if the sample is very volatile, you can lower the temperature of the heater. So essentially, with the system uh, using the sample holders that, have, that are provided, one can analyze both liquids and solids. And uh, using uh, easy-to-use software, you can get the results in a few seconds. So now I would like to go into more of the uh, experimental details and the results section of the talk. So I'm going to show you some data of gold-capped ligands in both positive and negative mode of ionization. Uh, there are some materials that ionize better in positive mode because of their nature, and negative mode, and some in negative mode. Uh, I'm going to show you some software tools that aid in the quick characterization of the presence and absence of these capped ligands on nanomaterials, show you some um, semi-quant work that we did uh, for the capped ligands attached to the nanomaterials, and finally show you some analysis of mixtures of ligands attached to the nanomaterials. So the list of uh, this, this is a slide showing the list of the various capped ligands to the gold uh, nanomaterials that we analyzed for this study. Uh, all of these were purchased from one single manufacturer. And you can see it's, a wide, it's quite a big, uh, wide variety of capped ligands that we analyzed. So the analysis, like I have uh, previously mentioned, was uh, essentially layering the sample on the mesh, uh, uh, and in some cases to improve the sensitivity, multiple layering was done. The uh, temperature of the ion gun was maintained at 350 degrees centigrade, so this temperature will not be sufficient enough, obviously, to ionize the gold itself, but it will be sufficient to break the covalent bonds uh, between gold and thiol, for instance, and release the ligands, which then enter in, into the mass spectrometer and get detected. Uh, the analysis time was between 20 to 30 seconds. So I'm going to show you some uh, data with uh, branched polyethylene imine, or BPEI for short, that was capped onto the gold nanoparticles. Uh, it, this, we analyzed essentially the standard of BPI that was used to modify the gold uh, nanomaterial. 
Uh, you can see from the spectrum that it is a mass range between 100 to 500 Daltons. There is a repeating 43 Dalton units, uh, which uh, corresponds to CH2CH2NH. So indeed, this is a BPI polymer as you would expect. Now the manufacturer uh, conjugated the BPEI to the gold through lipoic acid. So essentially you have uh, thiols linking the gold to the lipoic acid. The lipoic acid has a free carboxylic group that then uh, is coupled to the amine terminal of BPEI to generate an amide bond. So this is how uh, the particle is, is made. So when we actually analyze the gold nanomaterial, uh, which was modified with BPI, we found the spectrum to look identical to the standard, or very similar to the standard. It had the classic BPI polymer with the repeating uh, units of about 43 Daltons. Now we dug more deeply into the spectrum, and uh, we were able to identify uh, the lipoic acid conjugates to the BPI. So like you can see on the slide, some of the predominant BPI polymer ions are 278, 319, 362. You add to that lipoic acid, which is about 206 with the loss of water, you're going to generate ions corresponding to the lipoic BPI conjugates. So that would be 421, 464, 507. And if you extract these particular uh, ions out of the spectrum, you find that they are there in the lipoic acid uh, BPI modified gold nanoparticle, but they are not present in the control gold or in the BPI standard. So this is showing you very clear spectral evidence of BPI conjugated to gold via the lipoic acid as, as the linker. Uh, I do want to mention that the amid bond is is labile and it is uh, going to fall apart during the analysis, which is prop and releasing the free BPI, which would explain why you see in the spectrum of the gold modified BPI, the predominantly the, BP the free BPI ions. So uh, the DSA TOF could be a technique that could be used as a quality control for the manufacturing process. Uh, if you look on the slide, we were actually given two lots, sent two lots by the manufacturer. And you can clearly see lot two has a classic BPI spectrum, but lot one uh, does not, showing that it's not being, uh, has not been as efficiently modified by BPI as lot two. I'd like to now shift gears and show you some of the results we got with other uh, ligands capped to gold, including PEG, uh, dodecane thiol, and CTAP. So this was a PEG standard that was uh, used by the manufacturer to modify uh, the gold particle. As you know, PEG is a very commonly used ligand, and uh, the standard it showed uh, the PEG series which is shown in uh, red. And uh, there's also the uh, methoxy peg series. We also observed the methoxy peg series in the standard, uh, which is shown in black. The mass accuracy of the peg polymers was within 5 ppm uh, and uh, gave us great confidence in what we were saying. Now we looked at the gold material that was modified with the PEG and the spectrum for that looked identical to the uh, PEG standard. It showed the PEG series, it also showed the methoxy PEG series, just like the standard. Now uh, PEG, as most of you know, is a common lab contaminant and we wanted to eliminate uh, that as a possibility. So uh, we extracted some of these predominant ions in the PEG spectrum that you see here and uh, try to look at these ions in the unmodified gold and in the blank mesh. And as you can see, 
the ions are present only in the peg modified gold uh, at we looked at it at for the different uh, at the different gold uh, particle sizes 40 nanometers 70 and 100 they should they showed the peg predominant peg ions but the unmodified gold and the blank mesh did not so this eliminated the possibility of any uh, lab contamination in the on the mesh Here's a spectrum of uh, dodecane th thiol capped uh, gold nanoparticles. Uh, in the spectrum, we observed the dimer and trimer of dodecane thiol. Uh, interestingly, we also observed the dimer of octadecane thiol. This seems to suggest that the standard that was used to modify the gold nanoparticles uh, most likely had octadecane thiol as a contaminant. So, this shows the power of the TOF mass technology. Uh, it's one of the most selective ways to identify ligands on nanoparticles, and uh, it's uh, able to show uh, some of these contaminants that could be present in the standards as, as they are used to modify uh, the particles. And, and the power of the TOF mass spec technology lies in the fact that it gives you accurate mass and uh, isotope profile information. So here is an example uh, on the slide with regard to dodecane thiol trimer. It's showing very good ion statistics right up to the fourth uh, isotope of the molecule. And if you look at the PPM mass accuracy between the expected and observed, you're going to get you're getting less than 3 ppm mass accuracy, which is excellent. Uh, the same goes for the isotope intensity. Uh, right up to the fourth isotope, you're getting within 3% uh, isotope accuracy. And uh, as you all know, three sulfur atoms present in the molecule contribute to a unique isotope profile ratio. So all this gives a lot of confidence in the data and, and confirms the presence of the molecule uh, on the ligand, on the uh, gold particle, excuse me. So here's a spectrum for uh, cethyl trimethyl ammonia bromide that was uh, supposedly on the nanoparticle. We saw a spectrum corresponding to a mass to charge of about 284.3314. Uh, now, using this information, uh, we could actually mine, use uh, the Axion ECID software uh, to try to identify what the elemental composition of this molecule could be. Now, the software can match against, can match against uh, the, the, molecule, the accurate mass against uh, a selected database and, and mine for the possible elemental composition of the, of the ion. And uh, in this case, we selected the database to be PubChem, which has close to about 25 million structures. And mine, mining against that, we got one single hit uh, for the elemental composition. And that turns out to be exactly what you would expect for CTAB. So this, this software, along with the accurate mass and isotope profile information, uh, gave us confirmation that, in fact, the ligand was CTAB. I'd like to now shift gears and show you some uh, software tools that help in characterizing uh, target analytes on the nanoparticles in large batches of samples. Uh, we use the Axion Solo software for this. Um, it has a very easy to read uh, color coding scheme that helps you to very quickly identify presence and absence of target analytes in samples. So for instance, on this slide, you see the samples that show up in bright orange, and those are the samples that contain uh, CTAB, while the spots that show light up gray show the absence of CTAB in those samples. The top uh, corner here, uh, the top corner shows the spectrum for the selected sample. Now here's an example of lipoic acid that was uh, attached to the nanoparticle that we uh, analyzed. 
the gray spots, which would be the control, negative control samples, that's the blank mesh, and the unmodified gold particles show up in gray because they don't have the lipoic acid. The lipoic acid was color-coded in, in red, and the spots that light up in red was the mesh that was spotted with the lipoic acid standard, and, uh, and, the, me and the spot that had lipoic acid modified gold nanoparticle. Uh, I do want to mention this analysis was done in negative mode because lipoic acid will ionize in negative mode because of the presence of the free carboxylic group. Now, this is a slide showing the analysis of mixtures of uh, two different types of ligands on the nanoparticles. So um, we were looking at mixtures of nanoparticles that contained dodecanethiol and CTAP. Now, uh, the, the color coding scheme for dodecanethiol was green, and you, were not, you would expect the negative controls, which would be the CTAP capped gold or the unmodified gold particles, to, not, to be in gray because they don't have any dodecanethiol. But the mixed sample, along with the dodecanethiol modified gold particle, light up in green. Uh, because they are showing the presence of dodecanethiol. Now, if you press on this particular sample, that is the mixed sample, you're going to get a lot of information uh, right on this page on what are the target analytes uh, that are present in the molecule, in the sample. And it's showing yes for uh, CTAB and the dodecanethiol dimer and trimer. The spectral information for this sample is in the top right-hand corner. So you can see the easy-to-use software that helps us identify some of these target analytes in the nanomaterials in a very quick and simple manner. This is a slide showing a semi-quantitative analysis that we tried where we loaded the mesh with different amounts of BPI modified gold, and you can see a correlation between the intensity and the amount that was spotted on the mesh. So this provides the possibility of using the DSA TOF as a semi-quantitative tool for looking at some of these nanomaterials bound, uh, some of these ligands bound to the nanomaterials. So in summary, using ambient ionization uh, DSA source, with the high-resolution accurate mass TOF mass spectrometer, uh, we were able to characterize ligand capping of gold nanoparticles. Uh, mass spectral analysis showed the BPI ligand bound to gold through lipoic acid. So essentially, we'll we were able to monitor for bilayers, in a sense. Uh, analysis of dodecanethiol capped ligands showed impurities that could be that are possibly bound to the nanomaterials. I gave you the example, I'll show you the example with octadecanethiol. Um, and the possibility of doing semi quantitative analysis uh, using the DSA TOF system. And finally, mixtures of ligands bound to the nanoparticles uh, could be identified and confirmed using DSA TOF. So, in conclusion, uh, mass spectrometry is one of the most selective and specific detection tools that's available to identify the organic ligands bound to nanoparticles. Uh, and I hope I've convinced you of that. More specifically, mass spectrometry with DSA TOF allows for rapid identification and confirmation of these ligands without any elaborate sample preparation. The analysis was done in a few seconds. And the the DSA TOF system, along with powerful visualization tools, offers a very rapid way to screen and confirm for ligands uh, capped on, on the nanoparticles. At this stage, I'm going to hand, the, hand it over to Chari to complete the webcast. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Shiranya. Um, <clears throat> um, so um, a few more slides, and um, uh, our webcast will come to an end. Um, really, I, um, 
the application that uh, Dr. Reddy talked about today handles the DSA TOF and mainly uh, looking at targeting ligands uh, sitting on the surface of nanomaterials or nanoparticles in this concrete example. Um, the next uh, the next webcast will be the webcast number three in this series. We'll look at the uh, uh, the, the UV Viz Near IR uh, platform. In that uh, in that webcast, uh, we actually going to have uh, Dr. Jeff Taylor, who's going to uh, who's going to join us, uh, or who's going to be uh, mainly the, our principal speaker in that uh, webcast. And uh, we are aiming on um, on the below. Uh, key learning objective for that webcast, mainly how to use different module uh, that can be mounted on a UV Viz near IR platform, um, especially the center, uh, the center mount technique that allows us to look at uh, uh, the presence of uh, nanomaterials in cosmetics and the ARTA, which is the automated angular uh, resolve scattering techniques, which allows us to look at the shape of nanomaterials um, when it comes um, on uh, mainly the structure of nanomaterials. Uh, with that, um, I come to the end uh, of uh, my uh, my slides. Um, with that, I will turn it uh, over uh, to, to Laura for the uh, question and, uh, and answer section of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chadi, and thank you, Sharanya, for your excellent presentation. It is indeed time for the question and answer period. As a reminder to all of you in the audience, if you would like to submit a question, just click on that Q&A box that you can find by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of your presentation window. And then you can type in your question and we'll ask our speakers. Okay, first question, Sharanya, yeah, this first one's for you. This is kind of a long one, so if you need me to repeat any of it, just let me know. Is, does this method work for polymeric nanoparticles? As you said, 350 degrees is not to ionize the gold, but can ionize the, the ligand. If the nanoparticle is polymeric, is it possible to ionize only the surface ligand? Uh, yes, uh, it is. This is essentially the technology. The temperature is not hot enough to ionize the, uh, to vaporize the. You need to get the, the molecule in vapor form before you ionize it. So if you are looking uh, at the gold particles, they are not going to ionize at 350 degrees centigrade, which is where I did the experiments. But it is sufficient to break the ligands. Uh, it's a, the thiol gold linkage and, uh, and, and vaporize that and then ionize it, which then enters into the mass spectrometer. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Sharanya, what is the mass range and accuracy of the DSA TOF technique? Yeah, so the uh, TOF by itself with an electrospray source can be, has a very wide mass range. So it can go anywhere from 18 to about 20,000 Daltons. Uh, when you have the DSA system, uh, it gets limited. The upper range gets limited to about 2,000 or 2,500 Daltons. And, and the reason for that is as the molecules get bigger, it's harder to volatilize them. And uh, also, this DSA source works with an APCI type of mechanism, so it doesn't allow for multiple charging of ions. Uh, it doesn't allow for multiple charging of ions, so that makes it difficult to look at very large molecules beyond 2,000 or 2,500. Very good. I now have another two-part question. What is the minimum quantity of sample that can be analyzed and also, can samples on other substrates, such as small metal objects, be analyzed? Yeah, good question. So uh, the sensitivity is a bit tricky because you have to, if the, if the ligand is attached to the gold particle uh, in, uh, and, and, and it covers the gold particle uh, and, it's, and the process has been done efficiently, uh, that would be the rate limiting step here. So uh, I have, in my experiments, had to load as much as 50 microgram of uh, nanoparticles and as little as 2 microgram of nanoparticles. So it really depends on how efficiently the ligand has been bound to the nanoparticles it would be my uh, best guess. And what was the second question? I'm sorry. The second was, also, can samples on other substrates, such as small metal objects, be analyzed? Uh, yes, we have at this point only analyzed gold, 
uh, nanoparticles, but uh, or rather ligands bound to gold nanoparticles, but you should be able to do this with, uh, I don't see any reason for not being able to do this with silver or silica or aluminum or any of the other metals. Excellent. This next question is very close to the preceding one, so you may have answered it, but I want to raise it in case there's a, a, a some part of this that wasn't addressed. The person specifically asking about semi-quantification of compounds and asks, down to what sample amount could DSA be used? Is it parts per billion for to semi-quantify compounds? Uh, like I said, again, it depends on the efficiency of modification of the gold or any other nanoparticle with the ligand. So uh, in my experience, I would say as low as a few microgram, uh, if it's been been efficiently modified with the ligand, I would be able to see. Uh, The best way to address this question would be to use uh, HPLC TOF as a way to get more hard, uh, back back it up with very hard uh, quantitative numbers. Very good. Can you analyze biomolecules attached to nanomaterials using the DSA TOF technology? Uh, Right. So like I said, uh, with biomolecules, if they are small peptides, uh, for instance, um, if they are in the mass range of uh, up to 1,000 or at least uh, 2,000, you should be able to identify them. But anything higher than that uh, will be not possible with the DSA TOF. Okay. One would have to go to the traditional electro spray off to do some of this work. Got it. Um, also, another related question to the previous one, so you, someone was addressing this, but so just to confirm that can the DSA TOF be used for other types of analyses besides nanomaterials? Uh, yes, the answer to that is uh, an absolute yes. Uh, there are people in, uh, for instance, forensic labs and police departments that are using this technology to identify what's in the white powders that they have seized uh, during arrests. Uh, You can use this to identify, for instance, additives and plastics by just exposing, uh, you know, food packaging in front of the the TOF. And uh, you can also, uh, for instance, look at uh, there are people who have tried looking at pesticides on surfaces of fruits and vegetables. So there are lots of different applications that one could use this technology for, besides looking at ligands on nanoparticles. Excellent. Um, Chatty, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you two that kind of go together. So the first one is, besides gold, have you tried other nanomaterials, nanomaterials that have been modified with organic ligands? And the other question is, that metals were mentioned, is there any problem with copper? I mean, I think the, the both questions related to the same thing, and I think Sharanya did answer part of that question. Um, it doesn't matter what the substrate is. Uh, metals do not usually get volatiles uh, at, at such low temperature. Um, in addition to that, the temperature on the DSA front end is uh, it's something that um, it's a user-dependable. I mean, you can dial the temperature that you want based on what you're trying to achieve during your experimental setup. Uh, the most important thing is to keep in mind uh, that <clears throat> the technology is really used to look at what's sitting on the surface. So the surface could be uh, nanoparticles, could be a different shape. Uh, and um, so really the answer is no, there is no, there is no, uh, no influence to the substrate where it's made from. If it's metallic, it's not going to volatilize and it's not going to make it into the, uh, the DSA TOF. Okay, very good. Uh, Chatty, another one for you. I know the sample preparation takes most of the time in analysis, especially if it's liquid extraction. So are you saying there's no need for sample preparation with this technique? Uh, that's exactly uh, the, the purpose of the, um, I mean, this is exactly what the, the DSA stands for, is direct sample analysis. Uh, the idea behind it is just you really expose your samples uh, to that uh, ionized gas, um, so your, the gas also could be uh, uh, changeable depending on what you're trying to achieve, of course. Uh, but really, it's an ambient ionization process. So you put your sample in front of that uh, gun, whatever's sitting on the surface, and if the energy is sufficient to ionize it and make it volatile, it will go into your mass spectrometry, uh, max spectrometer. And, and we use a, a time of flight, so one of the most precise uh, mass spectrometer available on the market uh, that 
precisely give you what the molecule is. So this allows us to kind of uh, do a quick screening. And we're talking about, um, um, I mean, when we started the promotion for the product, uh, we're talking about a 15 seconds of sample uh, analysis time. You get the whole full spectrum. Excellent. Um, so, sorry, Sharani, another question for you. Can the DSA TOF be used as a quality control tool for assessing the efficiency of the capping process? Uh, yes, and I had one of the slides that I presented early on in the presentation that sort of addressed some of this with BPI, modified gold, and when the manufacturer sent us two different lots, uh, it was clear that they had been modified, uh, they had different efficiencies of modification. So I think that it is a possibility for using this as a quality control during the manufacturing process. Excellent. Chani, another one for you. How is this technology similar to or different from DART MS? I mean, um, it is, it is some, somehow similar, it is, uh, it, but it's also, uh, it's also different. Uh, the DART dif uses a different approach to ionize uh, the, uh, the molecules. Um, probably uh, probably Shirania will be better at answering uh, that question from a technical perspective. Uh, but I, I, I know for a fact that um, the, the DSA TOF has uh, some advantages over the DART when it comes to um, uh, the molecules on the surface of the material. Yeah, like so, like Chadi said, um, the uh, the DART is somewhat similar to the DSA, but we have certain advantages. We use helium, we use nitrogen as our ionizing gas, which is uh, much uh, less expensive than helium, and uh, and it provides sufficient energy to ionize a lot of these ligands, with no problem. Uh, there are certain things unique about the source, like I said, it has the covers that prevent outgassing. Uh, the other aspect is uh, we can infuse uh, liquids into the system while we're analyzing that helps to, uh, can, that can uh, if improve the ionization efficiencies of some of the molecules we're interested in. So there's a lots of unique features. Fantastic. All right, well, I think we'll wrap up now. Thank you so much for answering all those questions and for your excellent talk today. I'd also like to, I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience for participating today and for asking your questions. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making today's webcast possible. This webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of next year. You'll receive an email from Spectroscopy alerting you when the webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We hope to see you all next time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast. Characterization of functionalized nanoparticles using ambient ionization mass spectrometry. I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of LCGC and Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this web seminar presented by LCGC and Spectroscopy and sponsored by Perkins.